We have a baptism to look forward to in a few moments. Sadie is being baptized today, and we're so very happy that you've made this very important decision. Sadie and I are basically the same age when we were baptized. I was very close in age to Sadie when I was baptized in a little Baptist congregation called Ridgeview Baptist Church in my hometown of Mount Holly, North Carolina. I was baptized on a Sunday night, and I can remember that moment to this day. I went to Ridgeview Baptist Church from the time I was in the first grade until I was about to enter the eighth grade. My family had been very happy at Ridgeview, but toward the end of our time there, the youth group had evolved to where it was just me and my sister. We were the group. And my aunt, whose name was Hazel, but we called her Hazy. Aunt Hazy was our teacher. So there was a lot of family connection uh, in the youth program at Ridgeview Baptist Church. And I can remember the Wednesday night after youth group when my parents said in the car on the way home, we need to find a different church. We need to find a church with more young people, a church that puts more emphasis on young people. So the next Sunday, we dropped into a neighborhood church called Tucka Siege Baptist Church. That's a very prominent name in my hometown. There's a Baptist church named Tuck a siege, and we were very happy there for many years. They had a thriving youth program. Clearly, it was an emphasis in that church. The minister of the church was named Mac Presley, and in that tradition, we called him Preacher Mac. Everybody called him Preacher Mac. All these years later, I have three primary memories of Preacher Mac. The first one is he was a good man. He was a faithful pastor, and he did love the young people of the church. He and his wife, Christine, had three daughters of their own. And so we grew up with his daughters, and he was a good man, and I certainly remember that to this day. The second thing I remember about Preacher Mac is every Sunday he preached for 45 minutes. <laughs> Seriously, every Sunday. <laughs> The choir special finished at about 11.15. We started at 11, and every Sunday from 11.15 until noon, Preacher Mac had the word for us, 45 minutes every week. The third thing I remember about Preacher Mac is this. Every time he talked about the church building, he made a point of calling it the church house. And I don't know if that was one word or two for Preacher Mag, but he called it the church house. And the point was clear. He was saying to us, the church is the people. The building houses the church, but the church is the people. That was clearly his point, and I remember it clearly all these years later. So when I walked down the aisle that first Sunday we joined as a 13-year-old, no one in my orbit could have imagined that I would end up an Episcopal priest. <laughs> it was not in the cards, to anybody's knowledge, it was not on the horizon. It's very unlikely that I've ended up an Episcopal priest. But here I am. And, of course, one of the hallmarks of the Episcopal Church is our prayer book. The way we worship is one of the primary hallmarks of an Anglican, of an Episcopalian. And a hallmark of the prayer book is the catechism, an outline of the faith. And in the catechism, in the Book of Common Prayer, in a section of the catechism called the Church, we read on page 854 of the prayer book, what is the church? A foundational question. What is the church? 
And the answer is the church is the community of the new covenant. So Preacher Mac was right. The church is the people. The church is the community of the new covenant. And then there's the question, how was the church described in the Bible? Again, a foundational question. And the prayer book tells us the church is described as the body, and the B is capitalized. The body of Jesus Christ, who is the head, and the body of Christ of which all baptized persons are members. What did we say just a moment ago in introducing the service? There is one body, and that B is capitalized. So we're gathered today as the body of Christ. Think about what a privilege that is. And I also ask you, think about the responsibility that comes with it. And then there's the question, what is the mission of the church? Again, a foundational question. And the prayer book tells us the mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. So let's just pause for a moment and really hear what's being said. This is religious language that we expect to hear in the context of liturgy. But I ask us to really hear what's being said. The mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. Think about that responsibility in the moment in which we are living. When there's so much talk of and experience of division in culture. When so much of the rhetoric we hear is about how divided we are. Meanwhile, the mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. And then the question is, how does the church pursue its mission? And the prayer book tells us, the church pursues its mission as it prays and worships, proclaims the gospel, the good news, and promotes justice, peace, and love. What a gift we've been given, membership in the body of Christ. But what a responsibility we have to follow in his footsteps. The final question in the section on the church is, through whom does the church carry out its mission? And the catechism tells us the church carries out its mission through the ministry of all its members. So every one of us in this room and every other sister or brother in Christ in the world, in the end we have the same responsibility to know Christ and to make him known, his love, his grace, his healing, and reconciling spirit. So I'm up here every Sunday preaching, most Sundays. I'm celebrating at the table most Sundays. I do a lot of teaching throughout the year. I won't hold it against you if you don't believe when I tell you that when I was a teenager, I hardly opened my mouth ever in church. I didn't open it many other places either. I felt comfortable in athletics when I was a teenager. Athletics is where I was comfortable in my own skin. But I promise you, nobody in my orbit when I was a teenager could possibly have imagined that I would end up an Episcopal priest and would be comfortable in a pulpit, would be comfortable teaching 
classes throughout the year. We can change over time. God isn't finished with us yet. But I was very shy when I was a teenager. I was in church every Sunday, but never opened my mouth. I'll tell you one quick story about that. Earlier in my uh, time here at St. Luke's, I published a a book on the uh, parable of the prodigal son. And I wanted to give a book to my Sunday school teacher when I was a teenager. And so through my parents, I sent this man a copy of that book. His name is Gary Cooper, a great name for somebody to have. Those of us of a certain age get the reference. But my Sunday school teacher, junior high and high school, was Gary Cooper. And so my parents give him this book, and his response to them was, that boy never said a word in Sunday school. He never said a word. And now he's a pastor, and he's writing books and preaching. It would have been impossible to imagine back then. I'm telling you that story to tell you this, but I was listening to every word that was spoken in church. From the pulpit, the scriptures, the hymnody. I was listening to what my Sunday school teachers said. And I remember to this day Preacher Mac saying, We're going to meet at the church house because the church is the people. Which brings us to Mark chapter 13, verse 1. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Imagine a group of country boys from Galilee have followed their teacher to the big city of Jerusalem. The temple was one of the wonders of the ancient world. The historian Josephus tells us some details about its scale and its beauty. It was a massive structure beautifully adorned in gold. People at the time said, on a sunny day, it shines like a star. And so the disciples in Jerusalem are enamored of the temple. They're awestruck by it. Perfectly understandable reaction. But Jesus immediately seizes upon the teachable moment and says, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. This is the last thing a group of Jewish men would have wanted to hear from their teacher, that their temple, God's house, would be destroyed. It was scandalous of Jesus to prophesy such a thing. And yet he knew that his body going forward, body with a B, capital B, Jesus knew that the body of Christ would be the people, not the structure in which they worship, but the people are the body of Christ. A scholar named James A. Brooks says about verses 1 through 2, The temple was no longer to be the focus of Christian hope. Going forward, Jesus himself was to be the focus of Christian hope. It was scandalous of Jesus to prophesy the destruction of the temple, and yet he was prophetic. In a mere 40 or so years, In the year 70 A.D., Roman soldiers burned the interior of the temple. And after the interior had been burned, they tore down the temple stone by stone to extract the gold that had been so prominent in the temple's adornment. Within 40 years of Jesus' prophecy, 
the temple was destroyed. And yet, some 2,000 years later, here we are, the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, alive and well, because it's the people, people like us, who make up the body of Christ. I met Preacher Mac when I was going up into the eighth grade. About a week and a half or so ago, I turned 62. All these years later, I can still hear Preacher Mac in my mind telling us about the church house. We're going to meet at the church house because we, he was saying, we are the church. I don't know how our young people are going to remember me in 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years. Maybe they'll remember that he used to tell us the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Maybe, maybe that's what they'll remember someday. He used to tell us to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, that's what I'm telling us today. We live in a pivotal moment in American history. We live in a pivotal moment in world history. We do live in a time when there are deep cultural divisions. It's important for us to have a sense of history, though, in a moment like this. There have been periods of deep cultural division before in this country, and there will no doubt be similar seasons in the future. What makes our time different is the omnipresence of social media and the 24-hour cable news cycle. What makes our moment in history different is we can't get away from the rhetoric of division and strife from one end of the continuum to the other. It's constant, the rhetoric of division. So the question before us is not whether we're living in a pivotal moment. We clearly are. The question before us is, how will we respond? And that is up to us. It's up to us as individuals how we use our gift of speech, how we share our thoughts or not with others. And it's up to us as the body of Christ, capital B, the people of God, of all people, how are we meant to respond to this pivotal moment in history? Today our liturgy is grounded in baptism. And as the baptismal liturgy unfolds, we'll be asked three haunting questions. The first one of those is, will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? This is asked to everybody as part of the baptismal covenant. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Just think about what a responsibility that is and what a privilege. And then we'll be asked, will you seek and serve Christ in all persons? Loving your neighbor as yourself. Notice, please, the lack of qualifiers. We're not asked, will you serve those who make it easy? It doesn't say, will you seek and serve those who are most like you? The question is, will you seek and serve all persons the way Christ sought? and served all persons. And then the third question, will you strive for justice and peace among all people? 
not just do you affirm the concept, but will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? These are our choices in the moment that is now. It's a tall order to follow the footsteps of Jesus. It's a high calling to be baptized into the body of Christ. Yet it is our mission in life to know the love of Christ and then to make his love known. Amen.